Well, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And if you'll look around, uh, look, look around, see all the red in the room. I'm wearing a little red for Valentine's and several other people are, and we just come to celebrate, and it's kind of a unique time to have Valentine's Day on Sunday, and I love that. Uh, when we think about Valentine's Day, don't we usually think about, um, isn't the application usually dating or marriage and that sort of thing? Well, Jason was and still is a married man, and he married a young lady named Karen, and they just had a good relationship, great relationship, and he, he wanted to be a really good husband. He really wanted to, to do that. So he made some adjustments in his own life so he could be a better husband. One of the adjustments he made is that he would, he would go to the mall with his wife shopping. I'm telling you, that is an amazing sacrifice, and he did it. He, he was at the mall, and he was with his wife, and they were shopping, and, and uh, then she decided, hey, I, I love this dress, trying to dress, I'm going to buy this dress, and, but she didn't have enough uh, money and uh, cash, and so she asked Jason, would you, would you go to the ATM, get me out some more money, I'm going to like to buy this dress, and you know what Jason said? He said, you know, Valentine's Day is not, not that far away. Sweetheart, whatever you want, you get it. I mean, he's like husband of the year. Is that not true? Just an amazing, amazing husband. So he goes to the ATM. He's going to draw out some money. And at the ATM at the mall, there was this, this line. And so he got in the line just sort of waiting for the people. And, and this, a, a friend of his was actually at the mall at the same time, just happened to walk by. And so they were, he stopped, and they were talking. And and after they were talking a while, Jason admitted, I've got a real problem, and I don't know what to do. Well, what's your problem? He said, well, I can't remember the PIN number, the code for my ATM. I can't remember it. And the other guy said, well, it's not a problem. I'll just stay right here in line. I'll take your place. You go ask Karen. He said, I can't do that because the PIN number is the date of our wedding anniversary. And I... You want to be a good husband. You just really want to be the very best husband. But there's so many things to remember to be a great husband. So usually when we come like you kind of expect on Valentine's Day, probably going to preach on marriage or dating or something like that. And I'm sure a lot of pastors are doing that today. But I'm going to break rank here, and I'm going to, I want to talk about a different topic. It's going to be about the topic of friendship. You don't hear many of those kinds of messages. The topic of friendship, it's still about relationships, so maybe it still counts. We're going through the book of Proverbs together, and we're really going subject by subject because that's how Proverbs was intended to be understood. And I want to talk to you about this subject of friendship. And I, I found some definitions of friendship. For instance, a friend is someone who goes on liking you no matter how successful either one of you have become. That's a friend. A friend is someone who knows all about you, inside and out, and still likes you. That's a friend. A friend is someone who believes in you when you have ceased to believe in yourself. Now, this is from Irma Bombeck, and probably you've never even heard of Irma Bombeck, but... She's kind of a funny lady, and here's how she put it. A friend is someone who does not go on a diet when you are fat. This, and if you, she's, this is, you can, you can imagine this coming out of this woman's mouth. Friends don't give friends fruitcakes. And this is a true thing. If you're really a friend, don't, you don't give fruitcake to, to a friend. Because if you're going to really take in that much sugar and that much fat grams, it's got to be great. Because the penalty you're going to pay after you get through eating it, and you don't want to waste that on a fruitcake. You know what I'm saying? The series title is uh, Wise Up Making Better Decisions. And as you've been reading through the book of Proverbs, haven't you noticed how many times... Solomon talks about friends. There's, it's just all through this book. He, he talks a great deal about friendship. And I think it's because Solomon understood that this, one of the big aspects, the strategies of God in our lives, was to help build us up 
through right friends. And Solomon just keeps talking about that. One of the things that God intended to do with us is to bring us into a sense of community with a group of people that would really benefit us and bless us and help us. And he intended that many, if not all, of our closest friends be of the family of faith, be, be Christ followers, to, to share our values and, and our aspirations of life and that sort of thing, especially that there would be a, a lot of our friends that would be a part of our church, our local church family. I want to talk to you today as one of the applications, and it's not but just for a little bit, but one of the applications about the idea of small group. Because quite honestly, it is within that context that a lot of what Solomon teaches us about friendship can actually become reality in our lives. So I'm, at least part of the application is in that direction. So as we get started, here's the, here's the main idea as we get started is that friendships matter. In God's plan for our life, he intended for us to have great friendships that brought great benefit to our life. For instance, Proverbs uh, chapter 18, verse 24 says it this way, a man of many companions. And that word companions really could be understood more as acquaintances or Facebook friends. And so uh, a person with many Facebook friends may come to ruin. Well, I think that's pretty interesting. But there is a friend didn't say there are many. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That word that is translated sticks is actually the exact same word that is in, in Genesis chapter 2 talking about marriage and a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It's the same word, exactly same word. And it means to stick to like glue. There is a friend that will stick to you even closer than a brother. That's what God wanted. Now, what is amazing to me is as you think about this, oh, wait a minute, let me keep going. Uh, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 10. Now, in your, in your notes, it says 17, verse 10. That was a typo. It's 27, verse 10. You might correct that. Do not forsake your own friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a friend nearby than a brother far away. What's interesting to me is that Solomon actually suggests to us that there are some times in our lives that friends meet a need in our life that family cannot. And it's amazing he would say that because family was everything in the Jewish community, in the Jewish culture, and yet this is what Solomon is saying. There, God intends there to be some friends in your life that become so close to you if you allow this to happen that they actually meet needs that even family members cannot meet. It's interesting to me that in the very waning moments of Jesus' life, right before he went to the cross, that Jesus actually talked about the issue of friendship. And he, he turned to his disciples and he said to them, you are my friends. I don't remember another place in which Jesus said that. I don't remember reading another place. But right before he came to the end, before the cross, you are my friends. And no greater love could anyone have but that he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus is saying, what I'm about to do, I, I am doing out of my love for you as a friend. And then you remember that in John chapter 17, this is the great, this is such a great passage. You've got to read this passage. John chapter 17, this is the real Lord's Prayer. We, we call the other uh, Lord's, the Lord's Prayer. It's really the model prayer. Here's how you pray. But this is where the, where the Lord opens up his heart, where Jesus opens up his heart, says, here's who I really am. And in this moment, right before he was crucified, in John chapter 17, praise this prayer. And, and here, here is what he says. He says, my prayer is not for them, meaning the disciples, meaning the ones he said, you're my friends. My prayer is not for them, my friends alone, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. He's talking about all of us. It was as though he looked down through time and he saw you. He saw you and me. And he prayed for us too. 
my prayer is not just for my friends alone, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I'm going to tell you the greatest statement of authenticity of Christianity is, is not our arguing apologetics. It's not our moral stance. Though those things are important. I'm not to, taking away from those at all. But, but the greatest authenticity of our Christianity is our love for each other, how we treat each other and for others. In the New Testament, there are 58 one another's. I, I, I was... I was surprised by this. One another commands. Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, share with one another. And if you think about this, Jesus intended for these one another's to be experienced in community. We can't do that in this room. I mean, this room, I think, is important. I'm so grateful for this room. I get to be a part of your life in this room. And our worship team gets to be a part of your life in this room. And worship is a part of of, of the Christian life, but it's a part of the strategy. But it's not all about worship. This is why our strategy at our church is to worship, connect, serve, and share. Because not everything that God wants to do, and even not even some of the greatest things God wants to do in our life, can even take place in this room. I mean, look at us. Look, look how we're seated here with, in these rows. You, all you can do is look at the, the dander from the back of the hair in front of you. It's all about all you can do in this room. You, there's, no, there's no one to get one another, no community. We, we're together in this one. We, we worship together, but there's not what Jesus described. No, that part that Jesus described, he intended to be in small group. The heart of Christianity and community and one another is in small group. It's through small groups as as the second part of our strategy, worship, connect, serve, and share. It's through small groups that we share our values with other people, our love for God with other people. We get to know each other. We get to share life with each other. And oftentimes it's through that environment we begin to discover what our own spiritual gifts are, our own places where God wants us to serve and begin to find places to serve. It's in that environment we grow in our understanding of God and His Word. In that environment, you, you can ask questions. You can get deeper into certain passages, and you, you can really grow faster and stronger in that environment. We read and talk about the principles of God's Word and how to live a better life and a better Christian life and a life with each other. God intended the small group environment to be that environment. And so if, if this is it, Okay, I come to worship, I leave. If this is really seriously it, you're cheating yourself out of so much that God intended for you to experience and have. It's not worth that hour that somehow you saved by going home early. It's not worth it because you lose too much. He intended for us in that environment to come to know each other better and grow deeper. And, and the truth is at Sugar Creek, it's amazing. Uh, I think maybe more than most churches anywhere, we, it's about 70% if you count out all the wish worship venues that we do, including our church, children's worship and that sort of thing, about 70% of those who are in worship ha- are also in Bible fellowship, or we call it our small groups, and but we want more. We, we want every person to seriously consider this thing of being involved in worship. So we, we ask you, would you explore this? Because this is important for you. It's not about us. It's about you. Would you explore this idea? Getting more information about small groups. You can do that by going to the group link kiosk out in the commons after the service is over. In a short amount of time, you can start learning maybe some groups you could explore and be a part of. Sociologists I've been reading have noted that Americans a few decades ago 
had a shift that was not healthy. I think it was probably because so many more and more people were moving to the city and they don't even know their next door neighbor or the names of people that live on their cul-de-sac or whatever. And so what happened was is that a few decades ago, Americans began to see the idea of a friend as a commodity. I want some commercial or professional advantage from you. So if you can produce that for me, great. If you can't, I'm walking. I'm, this friendship wasn't worth it. So that people actually become a means to an end. But that was never intended. Real friends are the end. Not a means to the end. They are the end. You know and enjoy them just for themselves. And that's my question for you. Do you really have those kinds of relationships? I, I, I want to kind of leave the idea of small groups, and I want to go beyond that. And here's the question. What, what good do friendships actually do? Why did God really intend for friendships? A few years ago, there were some scientists that had done some study of, of the, the, the brain of a fish. And they discovered that there was one location on that fish's brain that was the reason why fish swim in schools. So they decided to do an experiment. They, they uh, uh, did a partial lobotomy and took out that section that causes a fish to swim in schools. And then healed him all back up, sewed him up, I don't know, all that. And then put, when it's time, put him back in the water. And what they discovered is he did everything he had been doing before. Or she, I don't know which it was, but would swim and eat, but didn't swim with others and swam by himself. And the most amazing thing happened because they put that fish right with other fish just like it. And what happened is that that fish took off and swam by himself. And what did the other fish do? They saw him, and they went and swam with him. So wherever he went, they swam with him. And now he became the leader of the school. A brainless fish <laughs> is now leading the school. And I thought to myself, this is... This is the only explanation for fads. This is the only thing that really makes sense about fads. Here is a guy that's got a cap, a baseball cap. He turns it to the side, and everybody's thinking, how weird is that? And then one person after another begins to turn to the side because he wants to be different just like everybody else. Isn't that right? It's the only explanation I've got for the whole blue jean thing of the blue jeans that it looks like they're coming off. They're, they can't possibly stay up. You're, you're watching them. You're looking. You know he isn't going to make it. He's walking. It's coming down. You know that. If you see these people and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at them, I, when is it coming? I know it's coming down. And you can see the underwear. This is, And then I discovered... Now there's designer underwear for people who want you to be able to see the underwear when their blue jeans are almost. How do they keep the blue jeans up? This is the big question. I don't know how it stays up. But now there's designer underwear for those who've got those jeans. And, I, and I'm thinking, how could that have caught on? And I, I'm realizing there's a lobotomies happening everywhere. And we're not knowing it. We didn't realize. So my question is, what do good friendships do? Well, the first thing is this. Good friendships help you stay on the right path. The book of Proverbs is all about the path. Good friendships help you stay on the path. They influence us for good or bad. Proverbs 13, 20, become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. This is Solomon. As one person put it, 
if you want to see what your life is going to be like five years from now, just look right now at the books you're reading and the people you're hanging out with. It's the predictor, he says, of what you will be like five years from now. now I've shared this story before about uh, but in a parenting seri- series, but I, I, it's time to share it again because this really fits, about my oldest son, Matthew. And he, Matthew and his family are members of our church and, and uh, 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 leaders in, in, in a particular area uh, in small groups. And uh, Matthew was either a freshman or a sophomore in high school, and I was just having a conversation. I just asked him the question, how's the peer pressure at high school? What, what are you feeling in the peer pressure at high school. He said, there's none. I don't feel any peer pressure at all in high school. And I said, well, explain that. He said, well, that happened in middle school. It was in middle school that I had to make decisions about my friendships. Now I've got all these friendships. They're in high school. And so I don't feel any peer pressure at all. I've got the group of people. And he picks some just, you know, really good guys, godly guys. And and he said, I don't feel any peer pressure. And I'm going to tell you, I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting on his bed, and we're talking, and I'm thinking, oh, my soul. It happened in middle school. And my youngest son, Jonathan, was just entering middle school. He had been at a Christian school. We were transferring to a public school, and it was all by the design. We had put together a plan, and this was what we had decided to do at this point. But he was going to a new school. He didn't know that many people. And so I, I went and told Kathy about the conversation, and, and we agreed on what, I should, what needs to happen. And I took Jonathan just one-on-one to breakfast the next morning. And Jonathan, he's just going into middle school in just a couple of months. It's going to start, and we're having breakfast together. And I told him about the conversation that Matthew and I had had and how critical middle school was, and it's, it's all about friends. Let me just say this. If you're a parent of a middle schooler or, or a child that's moving very closely in middle school, you really need to, you really need to get on your radar what's happening here. And so we're having breakfast. I told Jonathan what Matthew had said, and I, here's what I said to him. I said, going into a new school, you don't really know a lot of people yet. So here's what I'm going to say. You're going to be making friends, but no one is your real friend, your close friend, until your mom and dad say yes. No one is. We, we'll meet every single one of your friends. We will go, we'll, have, we'll meet their parents and but no one until the thumbs up. And some of you think, some of you are thinking right now, here's what you're really thinking. I'm really glad you're not talking. You're thinking, that is so severe. What right does a parent have to say to his middle school child, this is not your friend until we give the thumbs up? I will tell you, it's called parenting. That's really what it is about. It's called parenting. Because you understand that there is so much influence that happens in the friendships. You want to make sure. You want to be very careful. Help your child make great friends that will really be the right friends. But I'm going to tell you, it's not just about teenagers. It is also about adults because our friendships form us, and they're forming us even right now. One of the big issues is that, is that we got to be careful about the friendships because either they will get us off the right path or they will help us stay on the right path. The second thing is, is that friends tell us what others won't. If that's a real friend of yours, he or she will tell you that you have broccoli in your teeth. They will tell you straight up because they don't want you walking out the rest of your day. There's green teeth right in the middle, and no one is, they're all thinking, wow, isn't that so? I can't even look at your face. And, but your friend will tell you. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
a person doesn't get hardened in their heart against God in a day. It's, it doesn't happen just, okay, I'm waking up today and now I'm not going to like God or I'm going to have a hard heart. To, that doesn't happen in a day. That happens over a period of time with things that happen in their life and choices that may, they make. And a friend who's a friend sees the changes that are beginning to happen, sees what's taking place and confronts. And by confront, I don't mean being mean. I mean, hey, I'm seeing something happen. I'm seeing some changes happen. I'm just, I'm just wondering, I'm, what's going on? Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Proverbs 24, verse 26 says, An honest answer is the sign of true friendship. That's a friend. Friends take care of us when life is falling apart. And I, and I put down when. I want you to write in the word when, not if. Because if you're breathing air, you're having times in which life's falling apart. I have times in which I feel depressed. I have times in which I feel like a failure. I have times in which uh, I'm so disappointed in me. I, I feel fear. I fear, feel loneliness. I have times like that in my life. I, I, think, I think everybody does from time to time because it's just living life. It's real life. And when those times come, you need somebody that actually loves you. It's a real friend. As you walk through those moments in your life, that's what real friendship is about. And that's exactly what Solomon was saying in another one of his books, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Two people are better off than one. They can help each other succeed. If one person fails, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. The, the whole idea of just pushing people away, I'm not going to allow anybody to get close to me, I'm not going to have a friend, is really a dangerous choice. C.S. Lewis is the guy who said that when you go through pain, it's not a theological reasoning you need most. It's the slightest touch of human sympathy. When this day comes, you, you don't give a rip about your 1,000, 1,000 Facebook friends. You just want one friend or two or three that actually cares about you and is there for you, a real friend. This is one of the things about small groups that um, sometimes we struggle with. We, everybody walks into the small group sometimes, it seems like, and they've all got the, their life all put together. But I'm going to be honest with you, nobody really has all their life put together, never have any problems or struggles. It's just sometimes we just put on a smile. And sometimes what we really need is to, to say, you know, I, I've really had a tough week, and you're my friends, and I, would you pray for me? Would you help me? And to be willing to not have a smile when you don't really feel a smile and be who you are and what's really going on. Because here's the truth. Everybody in the room that looks like they got all of life by the tail are having their moments too. So, how do you be this kind of friend? First of all, you've got to decide to be the right kind of friend. You've got to take these principles of friendship and really begin to incorporate them in your life with a person or persons that you are building this friendship with. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, not just when everything is going good or you're acting right, but even when you're not acting right. A friend loves at all times. 
When other people are walking out, the friend walks in. The friend is there. The friend will not quit on you. You are the consistent one. This is being the friend. You're the consistent one. You're the dependable one. And when someone who is a friend shares something confidential with you, you hold it because you're a friend. You hold that confidentiality. Be somebody that other people can trust. Be somebody that builds others up instead of tears them down. And I don't mean criticism. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about be the person that helps bring them up spiritually, helps, helps lead them to God, helps them to stay on the right path instead of a person that takes them away from God who, who sort of helps divert them off the path. Be the right person kind of friend. Second of all, decide to find the right kind of person. Find a person who will challenge you. Find a person who makes you stronger. Iron sharpens iron kind of thing. Proverbs 27, 19, a mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the friends he chooses. What do you really like? Have you ever seen someone waste just years of their life because they got around the wrong people? Don't just pick who picks you. Don't just pick who picks you. You find the right kind of person, and that's who you pick. Third of all, take the initiative, Proverbs 18, 24. See what all these verses that Solomon just talking about, we're not just touching the surface of what he talks about, about friendship. A person who has friends must show himself friendly. So, okay, you don't have the kinds of friends we're talking about. Don't sit around and pout. Well, why isn't other people befriending me? Don't do that. You take the initiative. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall others give to you. With what measure you measure out will be measured back to you again. So measure out. Friendship. Be friends, and you'll have friends. may not have happened immediately, but it's coming. As one person said it this way, I went out to find a friend and didn't find any there. I went out to be a friend And friends were everywhere. And all the person is saying is, take the initiative. Del Carnegie wrote this, you can make more friends in two months. And this is a piece of great piece of wisdom here. You can make more friends in two months by becoming really interested in other people than you can in two years trying to get other people interested in you. Please be interested in me. No, you be interested in others. Fourth, be yourself. This is tough. I'm trying to find friends. I got to somehow put on a mask and I got to be somebody I'm not so they'll like me. If they knew who I really was inside, they won't like me. Well, then it's going to come out. Well, just be you. Be you. They're friends for you. You're a good person in the inside of your heart. Just be you. Don't try to be somebody else. Fifth, be patient. Don't try to make this happen overnight. You don't build deep relationships overnight. They're over a period of time. So be patient. Six, be reasonable. Don't become possessive and obsessive toward other people. I love this verse. It's really a funny verse if you think about it. Listen to what it says. Proverbs 25, 17. Let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he have his fill of you and hate you. I mean, look at the verse. Isn't that strange? But if you think about it, if your next door neighbor's at your house literally every day after day after day, well, maybe it's working out for you, but it's a rare thing if it is. More than likely, long before they stop coming every day, you're wishing they stopped coming every day. When are you going to stop? Hey, just don't answer the doorbell. Let's just act like we're gone. Even though the garage is up and all of our cars are right there, just we we want a long, long walk. Just don't don't answer the doorbell. And and it's the idea of this: give space to each other in that relationship. Don't come on so strong, and and don't be obsessive and possessive. Oh, you can't have any other friends but me. You got another friend? 
I mean, we are friends. You can't have any other friends. Don't be that way. All you do is really push people away that way. And, and here's the last one. Trust God to help you. He will. Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And the bottom line is, hey, God will answer your prayers. He'll, he'll provide a friend. Be patient. So there's my Valentine's sermon for today. This is a, well, I, I'm not, how you, I don't know who's doing that, but let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for loving us and for all that you have given to us and even the friendships that that you've built into our life. And God, thank you for that. They mean even more to us today. And the friendships to come, the people that you intend to bring into our life to help sharpen us and us to sharpen them, God, thank you for your word, for Solomon in the book of Proverbs, giving us some tools to work through and sort of think out, what am I looking for? What needs to happen? How do I need to be in this kind of relationship? God, the greatest friend. Oh, God, make the greatest friend in our life be Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Father, I pray in this room for those who've never received Jesus as Savior. Maybe they got a little religion or something, but they didn't get Jesus. There's no relationship that's building. God, I pray this would be the beginning of the change of that and that there would be many in this room today that say, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior, as my friend. Father, move in hearts today to make that decision. Move in hearts today to, you're speaking to their heart. They know Christ is Savior. They're not members of this church, but they really ought to be. And there's a sense in their heart, this, this place feels like home. And that's just you really turning their heart to this church. And move in hearts today to make those kinds of decisions, we pray in Jesus' name.